Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles program called Things We Said Today. This is a talk show podcast in which we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Beatles. It could be any part of their past, any part of the present, and sometimes we even dip into the future. And we also cover Beatle news on most of our shows. Really, anything is up for grabs here on this program. I'm Ken Michaels. And I'm one of the three regular co-hosts known for my other Beatles shows, a syndicated Beatles radio program called Every Little Thing, and another podcast show on the solo Beatles called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, which is a live broadcast every other week on Facebook. And I'm being joined by my two other regular co-hosts. First of all, a man who's been working at New York's WFUV for 35 years now. He Holy is smoke. <laughs> he is their Beatle guy, and he's done a ton of interviews, a lot of great work on the radio all these years, a mainstay at the radio station, which is hard to find in this day and age, and that's our own Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. Hey, how are you? How, how is everyone? Very good. And our other co-host, who's been with us quite a long time now, uh, has been writing for uh, publications like The Wall Street Journal and Beatle Fan and for many years was part of the classical department at the New York Times running articles for them. He's also the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and also got that something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. And that is our own Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken. Hello, everyone. We have a very interesting topic for the show this time out. And um, before I tell you what that is, what we normally do at the top of the show is uh, get to the latest in Beatle news. Before we do that, uh, all of our regular listeners will know from our last show that uh, Darren had a bit of an accident with his knee. And uh, I'm sure that many of our listeners want to know, they want an update of the status of your condition. Well, uh, even for those who have, couldn't care less, which I could understand, uh, they, <laughs> they, uh, they amputated the... No, I'm kidding. Um, two weeks ago, I had uh, major knee surgery on the left knee, and not just any left knee, my left knee, and it was uh, a shredded quadriceps tendon, uh, which is a delicacy in some countries. But uh, yeah, I blew out the, the quad tendon in my left knee, uh, and this was... Three weeks ago, actually, uh, was when I fell, and the surgery was last week. Uh, and this is the same thing, basically, I did to my right knee six years ago. So I'm kind of on my back and out of commission, away from WFUV. And things like the hosting or co-hosting the show is about uh, one of the only things I can do, because I could do it, uh, you know, sitting or laying down. or. But uh, it's going to be a slow road to recovery, and... Probably the next time we have a show in a couple of weeks, there'll be minimal, you know, news or improvement. It's going to be a gradual thing that's going to take me well into the summer before I start to uh, walk like Tim Conway on the Carol Burnett show. <laughs> so you're, that's doing, a tribute. you're doing this show reenacting yep. the bed in. It is exactly that. How did you, it is a bed in right now, folks. <laughs> Later on, I'm going to start. Uh, we'll do a sing along of uh, Give Peace a Chance. Mm hmm. And uh, but that's exactly what's happening. And like, what was what was the White Album song John sang on his back? Revolution. Um, yeah. So I, yeah. Yeah, I might break out into a version of Revolution at some point mid show. But uh, that's that's the deal with me. OK. Any any idea when you're likely to come back to FUV? Honestly, no, I have, I have not a clue. I don't know yet. There's a lot of things uh, that. The main reason is is I can't drive because my legs immobilize. Ouch! See, there's some <laughs> pain. There's some a pain for you, folks. My legs immobilized, and I have to depend on basically being driven everywhere. So trying to get a schedule that you know works with lots of moving parts is hard. So for the time being, I'll be away from FUV. But you know, hopefully, you know, within a month or two. I'll make some reappearances, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, but uh, I always put these things up on my Facebook page and, uh, you know, how things are going for the handful who care. So we'll, you know, we'll see as the weeks pass. 
Well, I know you have a fan base here who listen to you at FUV, so Thank just you. want to let them know. I want them to know when you might be returning. So, right. All right. Well, I'll obviously keep everyone posted. You'll know before I do, actually, I'm sure. Mm hmm. Okay. So before we get to Beatle News, I want to just let, let everyone know that I do have a major announcement to make about an imminent tour that is of interest to Beatle fans. And um, I'm sure some of you will be interested in this. And uh, amongst the Beatle audience, you might be among the first to find out about this, which I'll save as my last news item. Oh, uh, drag <laughs> out the suspense. Ken started, before we started recording the show, telling us about it, but, you know, feeding us little bits on a need-to-know basis only. So Alan and I still have no idea what he's talking about. Listen, Darren, you and I are radio guys. We know the art of the tease. <laughs> you got to perfect that skill. Yep. So anyway, <laughs> okay, in Beatle news, first of all, Paul McCartney resumed his Freshen Up tour. This was on May the 23rd at Smoothie King Center in New Orleans. And I looked at the set list. There are no changes from the last time that he played with the band. And uh, anyone want to comment about uh, about that or anything about the recent shows from, from Paul? Darren? A few things that I saw on Facebook, and very few, very unscientific, were people kind of commenting on the fact that Paul didn't really read anyone's signs and didn't bring a fan or two up on stage. It seemed like that got a little more reaction to the set list and lack of changes. Hmm. Um, but I think at this point, with his tours, his set list changes usually are subtle. And the fact that he didn't do any this time out didn't surprise me, you know? Um, yeah. So, I mean, I heard that, that was as negative as the few comments I saw was he didn't bring anyone up on stage like it has to happen. Mm -hmm. so, Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, that was really all I saw, you know, other than, oh, he was great. It's, you know, it's fabulous. He's still, how does he do it at his age? Those kind right. of things. And that's most of what I've read on Facebook from people who have gone to the, the shows in the last week and uh, the reviews, the fact that he's able to do what he what he has been doing still for a three hour show is phenomenal. And nobody, certainly not in the reviews, nobody complains about the set list. Mm hmm. You know, because he's he he fills the show with so many classic songs, a lot of Beatles, a little bit of Wings, the new stuff, the tributes to John and George, and for most people, certainly a more mainstream audience, they're happy with it. <laughs> so he does give you your money's worth, but to those of us who have really studied his catalog and wish he would go deeper, you know, those people are still disappointed. But at this point. You know, we've talked about this so many times here uh, on this show and the history of this show. You know, you reach a point where how can you even complain anymore <laughs> when when someone like him has given the world so much and he's still continuing to give. So, um, yeah, but that's the reaction that I've gotten from what I've been reading on Facebook from various articles and feedback from fans who have gone to see him. All right. In addition to that, the biggest news, I believe, of the past week is the news of four new reissues of Paul McCartney albums. Most of them are live recordings. We have Amoeba's Gig, which I'll talk about in a moment. There is Paul's Russian album, which for many years I pronounced Shoba B C C C P. But Alan has told me that the correct pronunciation in Russian is Snova. Snova, okay. So I'll have to say it correctly from now on. Snova B, CCCP. There's also Paul is Live and Wings Over America. Now, all of these releases are coming out on CD. They're all coming out on 180-gram vinyl. Amoeba's Gig is a two-album set. Paul is Live is a two-album set. Uh, Snova B, CCCP, is a single uh, vinyl. And uh, did I cover everything? No, Wings Over America is a double uh, double CD, three album, hundred eighty gram vinyl, and they're yeah. all coming out. They're all coming out on limited edition colored vinyl as well. Just to clarify something, you say that Paul is live is a double, but for the CD release, is it a double or a single like it originally was? It's a single. 
Okay. And uh, Amoeba's gig is uh, a single disc, double vinyl? Single, okay. right. Okay. Now, the thing, first of all, let me talk about Snova D, C-C-C-P, <laughs> uh, which has come out a few different ways. When it first came out exclusively in Russia, there were 11 tracks on it. It then was released later on on CD to, to the world with uh, 13 tracks, I believe. Mm -hmm. But this version that's coming out now is the original one with just 11. I don't know why, yeah, but that's, that's how it's coming out. That's a pity in a way, because in, in addition, I believe there were some Japanese B-sides from those sessions too that um, you know could fill it out further. And if you get the emails from Paul's website, uh, you know, with his various announcements, they actually say in the paragraph about that album that among the outtakes were, I saw her standing there, and yet right. it's not included. So it just seems like an awful tease, you know. Well, you know, give us that. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, it also God that they would include that album in this live. Uh, reissue campaign, use it, but using the logic that the songs were recorded live in the studio. Right, uh, right. But I still thought it was odd that they included, you know, the Russian album in this reissue campaign when they could have brought Unplugged back, for example, or, or back in the USA, or or the yeah, or European the version other, back in the world. Yeah. Right. Mm. Well, that could all happen later. Oh, That's it undoubtedly true. will. <laughs> <laughs> Um, every, everything happens in due time with Paul. But uh, as I'm looking, there was a 13-track edition, which I guess was on vinyl, and CD was a 14-track. Yeah, now, we also, we also know that from the same sessions, Paul recorded It's Now or Never, which never made it onto the Russian album itself, but it was on a compilation called The Last Temptation of Elvis, of all Elvis Presley songs. That was the only way it was released commercially. So that's something that could have been included in this. Mm -hmm. I also heard about other oldies like Cut Across Shorty. I think he recorded during these sessions. But um, yeah, so as it stands in the new reissue, it's just the 11 track version. But as for Amoeba's gig, the entire concert is being released for the first time. And this means... 21 tracks all together and it's kind of complicated the whole history with amoeba's uh gig this was a a concert that paul gave at amoeba's record store in los angeles at the time that memory almost full was released and uh, made a lot of headlines because ringo was in the audience jeff lynn was in the audience olivia harrison was there um a very intimate show and um i remember at first it was a four song ep that was released came out on CD, the four-song EP. It, that it, was it. in January of 2009. Then, a year later, there was a 12-track CD that was available for free with the UK newspaper Mail on Sunday. And it was called Live in Los Angeles, The Extended Set. Okay, But this is the first time that all 21 songs will be available. And as I said, uh, all these releases on CD... 180 gram vinyl and also colored vinyl as well so i'm most interested since i don't have the remaining songs from amoeba's gig in that release and uh are you guys excited about any of this yeah i guess so i guess so because i started uh oh, it gets confusing to remember all these things but i guess a couple of years ago when paul started to reissue again uh select titles on colored vinyl i started collecting those i hadn't bought any of the you know, reissue the McCartney uh, archive collection reissues on vinyl till the colored vinyl started popping up. So when I saw this, I was pretty excited because I could add additional titles to that. But uh, I did, you know, I just, I thought it was, oh, this is cool. More stuff to buy. But also thought it was weird the way they, they cherry picked what they chose to be yeah. in the set. And I'm sure there are plenty of folks who are kind of grumbling because I guess Wings Over America this new release on vinyl and CD is pretty much going to be what was just newly reissued how many years ago, five years ago, give or take? Mm -hmm. In the archive set, yeah. Yeah, you know, um, okay, they say that um, everything except for the Amoeba disc are remastered, but the Amoeba disc is remixed. 
Uh, so, I mean, that plus the fact that it's 20, the, all 21 tracks uh, makes that necessary. I mean, I ordered all of them on CD and vinyl, but I'm skipping the colored vinyl. I don't really care that much about that. I, I like having everything on vinyl as well, but one vinyl version will do. Um, I'm, I'm a little disappointed. I mean, I suppose uh, it, I haven't bothered to grumble. I'll do it now. Um, I, I do think, as I said before, that he should have put some of the extra already released material on the Russian album, the, the, the Japanese B-sides, the extra tracks from the uh, second Russian version and the CD version. And since they were going to bother telling us that I saw her standing there was among the outtakes, I guess they should have put that too. Um, Hmm. Maybe a a couple of other outtakes might have been nice. Um, To choose the version with the fewest songs just seems a little bizarre to me. They might as well also have taken the opportunity to expand Paul as live. You know? mm-hmm. But then, you know, if you look at it a little more closely, you see, as Darren said, you know, we did just get Wings Over America in the archive series, and now we're getting it again. So maybe the opposite will be the case with Paul is Live, where when that finally turns up in the archive series, then it will be expanded to be the complete set. Who knows? You know, if that's a, w- what they're going to do. I really do think he should sort of um, hark back to his policy during the Beatles era of wanting to give his fans, you know, best value for money and, you know, not sell a short version now, knowing that you're eventually going to sell a longer version. But we don't don't know that he's actually planning that. Uh, So... I don't know. I I just think that it's an opportunity that was missed. You know, there were a lot of people, let's face it, who are not fanatical collectors who have to have every different reissue version uh, who are going to say, you know what, I have Paul is live and I don't care if it's remastered, the original sounded okay. Whereas those people might have bought an expanded version just because it is giving them something they haven't already bought. So that's that's my feeling about the set. I mean, it was sort of interesting to see it coming so soon after the wildlife red rose and uh, European wings over Europe reissue. Well, mm-hmm. Two of those are reissues. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, uh, I, I think we'll. Uh, I'm sort of more interested in seeing what's next in the archive issues, where we're going to get outtakes and you know, more a more detailed look at the sessions. Right. But in a way, this is also Paul's way of keeping the music out there, mm-hmm. keeping it in print. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the the thing about the Russian album is a disappointment for me, but we don't know if in the near future he's going to reissue that with bonus tracks. We just don't know. There's still so much left in his catalog that needs to be reissued. So where it all falls uh, in the timeline, we don't know. Mm-hmm. But um, for right I mean, now, it's it's nice that it, that this is coming out. It's possible that, like you said, there is an, an ex- expanded Russian album in our future at some point that would contain all the tracks. Maybe this time out, the idea was to present it as it was originally released in the Soviet Union in 88, 87, 88, 88, 88. You know, so this is kind of like maybe perhaps the idea was. Let's do a replica of. Well, you could the- have. You could have the original as it was originally put out in Russia by playing the fourteen track CD and just not playing the last three tracks. <laughs> That's no fun, Alan. <laughs> no, 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 it's a lot of fun. <laughs> you get to play pretend. Mm. <laughs> Remember something new about you, Alan? Alan likes to play pretend. Uh-huh. <laughs> So, in other news, uh, on our last show, we were talking about the collector's item for um, the Traveler's Edition of Egypt Station and the Explorer's Edition. And we talked about the new song called Frank Sinatra's Party. And Alan had commented that that song was taken from an older song from Paul's catalog. And I had questioned him on it because I hadn't heard that before. And wouldn't you know it, the day after we did the recording of the show... (laughs) On Facebook, it had already posted a recording that Paul had made from 1976, and it was 
basically, it sounded like the backing tracks for Frank Sinatra's party. And it went under the title of Fishy Matters Underwater. So it is true that Frank Sinatra's party uh, at least started back in 1976. We don't know when Paul wrote the lyrics. And I'm not even sure, having listening, having listened to those backing tracks, if it's exactly the same one that Paul used for Frank Sinatra's party. But at least we do know that the song has more history to it. It's not just a brand new song, totally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, no, and, and actually it had been out on bootleg for a while. It, that's probably why I, you know, had this vague feeling that it was was an older track. It, it was It's on one of those Mr. Claude L compilations of, uh, of McCartney outtakes. I can't remember which one offhand. One of our okay. listeners will write in, but... But it's been it's been out there for a while, but just under, okay. under the different titles. So, you know, we never really ne- associated it necessarily with Frank Sinatra's party. Yeah. Well, I have a lot of bootlegs, but I don't have all of them. So this was news to me. Well, you know, there is so much out now uh, that it's getting really hard to keep track of what's out on bootleg and what isn't anymore. Uh, Mm -hmm. I'm thinking I have to go through them all and put them in a chronological list on my, you know, playlist on my computer just so I can keep track of what what is and isn't out. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have to send me that list. Okay. (laughs) So what happened? Accidentally. I won't do all the work. (laughs) (laughs) All right. A few other things here. Ringo Starr, along with wife Barbara Bach, attended the premiere of the new documentary film Echo in the Canyon. Uh, pictures have been shown online of Ringo with Stephen Stills, Roger McGuinn, and Jacob Dylan at this premiere. The film explores the intersection of rock and folk music that occurred among the artists of the, the Laurel Canyon neighborhood of Los Angeles in the mid to late 60s. And, as they term this, the cross-pollination that occurred with bands like the Beatles, Birds, Beach Boys, Mamas and Papas, and others. After being shown in the L.A. area on May the 24th, The film will be appearing in select theaters in New York City on May the 31st. I don't know if it's just for one day or not. Um, Other news, Peter Asher will have a new book coming out. It's called The Beatles from A to Z, an alphabetical mystery tour. The book is based on 26 episodes of his very popular radio series called From Me to You, which you can find on Sirius XM's Beatles channel. And the hardcover book comes out. November the 12th. All right. That's nice. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed Peter's show on things on the, the Beatles channel. Oh, you've listened to it? Yes. Yes, okay. many times. Well, I know that Peter is one of the best storytellers out there. And having seen him in concert so many times, he was meant to be on stage to talk about his life <laughs> and his career. And he's got so many stories to tell. And right. uh, he's, a, he's just a wonderful storyteller. You don't say. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the big news about this tour that I've been teasing people with is that there's going to be a band made up of Joey Molland of Badfinger, Todd Rundgren, Christopher Cross, and Mickey Dolenz touring together hmm. with the Beatles tribute band Rain to back them up. Now, this show, the first half of the show, will be these artists doing their own hits. And the second half of the show, they'll be performing songs from the White Album. Mm. Now, this is very much like the concept that was A Walk Down Abbey Road, which happened in the early 2000s. And if you recall, we had John Montagna on the show several shows back, the bass player. He was part of the backing band for A Walk Down Abbey Road, which was basically this very same concept. It was a whole bunch of artists who all had hits and popular songs on their own as a band with a backing band, which was at the time Godfrey Townsend and a group of musicians, of which John was a part of for the last lineup. The first half of the show was all these artists playing their own hits, and the second half of the show was all these artists with the backing band doing Beatles music. And at the time, Alan Parsons was in the show, and there were different lineups. Joey Molland happened to be in one of them, as as Todd Rundgren was, and Christopher Cross. Mickey Dolenz never was. So um, 
yeah, this is something that is going to happen. I've been told that I can make this announcement because I have heard from, it's actually Todd's wife who said I can go ahead and make the announcement. And some people have announced this already, including Joey Mullen, and it's on a lot of the Todd Rundgren Facebook pages. But amongst Beatle fans, many of them don't know about this. This tour is going to start September the 7th. It's going to run through October the 20th. I don't have a list of any of the venues yet. I just have a list of all the cities that they'll be playing. I've counted 25 dates so far anyway. Most of them will be on the East Coast. All right. So if you're a fan of any of those artists right there, you'd love to see them all together on stage. And they'll all have a blast doing Beatles songs the second half of the show. And they should be walking by then. Which is the most important thing of all, when you think about it. <laughs> but I'll bet that there'll be a lot of Monkees fans that would love to hear Mickey Dolan sing, Everybody's Got Something to Hide Except Me and My Monkey. No, no. <laughs> we'll find out if that happens. We'll be among the first to tell you <laughs> if that does happen. But as we know more... We will let you know here on this show. And since this show happens every two weeks, we'll make sure I do, as I will post any information that I have about this on our Facebook page for things we said today on my Facebook page. So we'll get the word out that way. So what do you think of that, guys? I think that's a, I think it's a fun, fun thing. I'm not a big fan of tribute bands, regardless of who you know the band tribute to. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've never really reacted to Rain or 1964 or, you know, any of the other bands. But, um, you know, I know I'm probably in the minority in mm -hmm. my kind of lack of interest in, in the tribute band concept. So, you know, I get it. This is a, a cool, should be a cool, fun thing. And, uh, you know, take it for that. I think I tend to prefer bands when they, you know, like in the case of the Beatles, bands like the Fab Foe play the music but they don't dress up and look and mimic every sound. Right. Uh, so uh, so I'll keep an open mind and hopefully be able to catch uh, the show when it comes through uh, the New York City area. I'm the same way, but I have a feeling that these four people, these four artists, are more of the main draw than the fact that Rain's backing them up. I and, could be wrong, but you know, I would think a lot of people would be going to these shows to see Todd or to see Mickey or any of these four people. Christopher Cross has always been an artist that's fascinated me uh, because he had that incredibly successful first album, which seems mm -hmm. like a lifetime ago now. Yeah. And none of his albums that came after that really came anywhere near as successful as that first record. Yet right. he has maintained uh, a fairly dedicated fan base and a visibility despite really not having anything that has really had much impact in commercial terms. Right. Uh, you know, and I recently came to my, after all of these years of loving the song, it only recently occurred to me that that's him playing lead guitar on Ride Like the Wind. Mm -hmm. And that's a heck of a guitar solo for a guy who almost immediately got pigeonholed as a soft rock artist and, you know, it made me, you know, curious about what else is kind of, you know, what else I'm in the dark about when it comes to Christopher Cross. So right. uh, his inclusion in this is, uh, I think, kind of interesting. The others are like kind of no brainers because, you know, they tend to pop up in this sort of Beatle related setting. Mm -hmm. So it, this should be uh, this should be interesting. Yeah, well, Christopher Cross had a, a history of doing studio work as a guitar player before he had his recording career mm -hmm. under his own name. So that doesn't surprise me. Alan, you want to comment at all? Um, not really. I mean, I, I pretty much agree with what Darren said about tribute bands. Um, and uh, and with what you say about the, the top build being probably more of the draw, I also, you know, agree, with, as Darren said, I mean, the tribute bands can be fun. I understand that. And I've, I've gone to some, when I found myself in a situation of being in a hall where a tribute band is playing, I've enjoyed it. You know, I've enjoyed the Weaklings, mm -hmm. Liverpool Shuffle, Rain. You know, I, 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 I don't like it as much when they dress up. I, I don't think it's necessary. 
Uh, yeah. But, you know, I mean, it's okay. I, 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 I'm not violently against it. Um, and I definitely do like it when established musicians take up, you know, Beatles stuff and see what they do. I mean, I love the things the Smithereens did, for instance. You know, yeah. that to me was, mm-hmm. was not a tribute band. It was a band paying tribute. <laughs> it, it's maybe a fine distinction, but but right. I know what I mean. And, you know, the the lineup that is going out on tour now, I mean, these are all guys who are interesting, and I, I, I bet it'll be an interesting show. So, But sort of all stating the obvious, so I will turn it back to you. Yeah, well, I agree that the way that the two of you see tribute bands. I don't go for the ones that dress up like the Beatles and have Beatle wigs and all that stuff. I only care about how they play the music and whether it's an interesting mix, you know, and I don't even consider this a tribute show in a way because half of it is them doing their own material. Sure. But the fun part of it is that the second half is Beatles songs, but it's these four guys singing it right. for the most part. So, and for people like these, they're all big Beatles fans to begin with. And someone like Todd Rundgren, who I've seen many times in concert, he does so many different tours every single year, but he loves the Beatles. And this is his way of being a Beatle geek <laughs> and also, just, uh, you know, also and that's why, part of the reason, that's part of the reason why he's toured with Ringo so much because he loves Ringo as a person and it's an honor to be with Ringo and the all-star band and it gives him a chance to play Beatles songs and work with all the other great artists and the all-stars. But also why the White Album in a year when Abbey Road and Let It Be are going to be what everybody's thinking about. We've already sort of done our White Album thing, so it's it's kind of an interesting question to me. Do you, did you know, I don't know, Ken? I have no idea why they're doing it this way. Oh. But, you know, to me, you can you can do a tribute to any Beatles album anytime. That's it true. doesn't have to revolve around anniversaries. Mm. Unless the planning stage has started or in the uh, height of the White Album reissue campaign late last year and was, you know, front and center on their minds. So they decided we'd do this tour. Why don't we concentrate, you know, on the White Album? And then by the time the logistics lay out for a summer tour, now we're... You know, months later, that could be why. That's possible. That's possible. But Todd is always touring, so that probably got in the way. <laughs> He's always busy. He's o- so many times he tours throughout the year, does several different tours throughout the year. And um, that could have been a reason why. Well, I don't know. Maybe right. this was maybe this was in the works for a while. Anyway, let's get to our main topic of the show. And um, this is kind of different because we're not doing a show that has to do with the specific work of the Beatles or, you know, of the solo careers or anything like that. This really has to do with the Beatles and us, meaning the three of us, Alan, Darren, and me. And I thought it'd be interesting to find out from the three of us how the Beatles influenced the three of us, how they influenced us in terms of maybe our musical tastes did it go beyond the music maybe they affected us with their different personalities and how they viewed life and how they handled their careers maybe they affected us in terms of um our fashion sense (laughs) or maybe maybe politically they influenced us there's any number of ways that the beatles could have influenced us all these years and since i never really go into detail when I talk to Alan and Darren uh, privately about this, we talk about our feelings about the music. I might learn something about the two of them, and they might learn something about me. And I think that would be kind of interesting. I like knowing how the Beatles affected people and something beyond beyond just loving the music. We all love the music. We all love the catalog. And most of us feel it's the greatest catalog of all time. Something that goes beyond that is there's something the Beatles brought to us that really affected us and all the things that that we love in life, whether it's music or anything else. So who would like to start first? I see a show of hands from both of you. Being that we're all lining up to go first, I guess I'll go first. It's a, this was it was an interesting topic when you suggested it, Ken, because I I'm always in my mind kind of going back to the very very early days in my life and the early music that I uh, listened to and why did I gravitate to music? Why did I gravitate to the Beatles and and some other hits of the era? And why am I a New York Mets fan? 
Uh, why, why, where, where in our personalities does all of this come from? I, I, I I'm, you know, only child, no brothers or sisters. My parents were not terribly musical, musically minded. And for some reason, as far back as possibly even before I turned four, I have one or two of these kind of snapshot memories in my head. And, you know, one of them includes having singles, Mm -hmm. which I always found very fascinating. I don't know where that came from. You know, there weren't any passionate music fans. Like I said, my parents weren't. I must have done something at a very, very early age. Again, we're talking just before or just after I turned four, which would would have been in 1969. I, you know, perhaps I asked for a record or reacted to a song on the radio that, you know, maybe my mother thought, ooh, maybe I'll buy him a record. He's got a, I had a show and tell phonograph. So, and maybe that's what clicked mm-hmm. with some kids that might be, I don't know. But for me, it was music. And what then gravitated me or pushed me towards the Beatles, I don't know. But there was definitely something in my DNA that was meant to attach itself, attach myself to uh, to the music of the Beatles in a fairly atten- intense way, even as far back as 1969. And I have clear memories of of getting let's see in no particular order getting the 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 let it be single when it was current the long and winding road single when it was newly released the hey jude album when it was brand new Uh, my father bringing home both abbey road and let it be at the same time and they tended to always get played my there was like a little bit of a line of delineation those were dad's albums but he would play them often for me abbey road and let it be you know, having the first pressing of, of Abbey Road in the house where it didn't say, hey, Jude, um, um, Her Majesty on the back cover. Uh, and having the Hey Jude album, which was my album that I played on my phonograph when I was just turning five, because I turned five about a month after Hey Jude, the album came out. Mm-hmm. Um, and having it where the label said the Beatles again. And so I very vividly remember these specific records and can picture myself to this day listening to these songs and the vibe that uh, came off these songs and affected a five-year-old that still I can kind of like relive today. I saw the Let It Be movie in the Palace Theater in Parkchester section of the Bronx in 1970 when I was five Hmm. and still can picture myself being in the theater. Why? Why does all this happen? That I don't have an answer for, but for me... From that very young age, the Beatles were making an impact. And uh, and there was also a visual aspect in my case. Perhaps it was logistically the fact that if you know me now and know how my size now to think that I was once a five year old kid that used to be able to sit on the kitchen counter in our apartment with my show and tell phonograph sitting and playing my records, looking down at them, the Apple label did something and other record labels too but first in that line was the apple label Just the apple spinning on my show and tell uh-huh. very very captivating mesmerizing whatever the case might be and i was on the road from that point to being the person buying all the colored vinyl variations that are coming out today uh, and that was all started at the you know 69 definitely it really kicked in in 1970 uh and the time of the beatle breakup i can still tell you that you know the the beatles solo were more my soundtrack because of the you know the being born in 1965 kind of coming to realize everything by the time i turned five and i'll still very quickly without even batting an eyelash i had one single from the four of them by 71 Uncle Albert, Admiral Halsey, It Don't Come Easy, Power to the People, and for some reason, uh, a little earlier than that, My Sweet Lord. Mm -hmm. That that was the the four. Those were my, you know, four, the Mount Rushmore of vinyl singles for a five- and six-year-old. And it just went from there, and, uh, you know, I tended to gravitate more to Paul for whatever reason. 
you know, every 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 gift, every record, maybe every other record purchased for me as a gift or given to me or whatever was was Beatle related and usually a McCartney and Wings record. And I've carried that ball without stopping, you know, all of these years, you mm-hmm. know, and uh, to say that Wings provided me with the main soundtrack to my youth is an understatement. You know, there were other bands, there were other songs, but they pale in comparison to what then what, uh, you know, what Wings meant to me growing up. And during that time also then being introduced to the Beatles uh, as an after, you know, as not so much an afterthought, but over the course of the 70s, while listening to the current stuff, mostly Wings, then getting introduced to what I had missed, you know, in the years when I was an infant and even before I was born. Mm-hmm. Which usually through at Christmas time, uh, one of the perks of being an only child was that Santa brought out everything for you. <laughs> you know, so I would get at Christmas time. I still can picture opening up, uh, you know, records and seeing Magical Mystery Tour for the first time and not knowing what the heck that was, or having asked for the blue album and the red album, not knowing what I was asking for that they were hits collections, but getting them at that point. And getting the White Album and the current compilations at the time, like rock and roll music, love songs, the Beatles, the Hollywood Bowl album, you know, getting randomly things like Beatles Six and and uh, Rubber Soul and Yesterday and Today and, you know, the Beatles second album on cassette. For whatever reason, I had that on cassette. Uh, You know, this is all stuff that to this day is vivid and is alive and has made me. The music junkie that uh, that I am uh, today across the board. But was there something specific about the Beatles that you heard in their music that you wanted to look for in other artists? I don't think initially. I I, I thought in, in terms of that, looking back now at the at what I tend to uh, gravitate towards, I could see it. I could see that that whole what I refer to as that whole power pop thing. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, kind of the Beatles, I wouldn't say they necessarily invented this genre, but they sure as heck were uh, right front, you know, dead center. I've always liked that guitar based pop rock band. Uh, And that has to be because the Beatles were the first thing that appealed to me that I gravitated towards and carried that uh, to the present. Give me a guitar or two guitars bass and drums and maybe keyboards and to me that's the quintessential thing uh and not exclusive i like other stuff too but i would say more so the beatles came first what was it about them what was it about their sound i have no idea but (laughs) you know but it did what for whatever reason like like when it comes to things like baseball i'm from new york city i'm from the bronx i'm from yankees country i'm a mets fan why i don't know honestly i can make assumptions you know, that could be everything from, you know, the Mets were the better of the two teams in the <laughs> very early. <laughs> At a certain time. <laughs> in the early 70s, you Weisenheimer, the Mets were the better of the two teams. They had won the 69 World Series, which I don't remember. Uh, they were back in the World Series in 73, which I do remember. Was that the only reason? Could have been. I actually was a Yankee fan, too. They were way second to the Mets, though. Mm. Um Could have been because my grandfather uh, was a New York Giants fan, uh, a National League baseball fan. Well, he didn't like the Dodgers, so he was a Dodger, a New York Giant fan, and may have gravitated to the Mets more than the Yankees. And then along I came, and he would babysit me, and maybe I saw more Met games on TV, and that's why I they appealed to me. Not a not clue, but the main thing is that it's what stuck, and it has remained a thing front and center in my life to the date to and music is number one for me with the Beatles right there at, uh, at the center of it. Hmm. But what I'm trying to get at in a way is that I'm sure that for all the artists that you like in music, individual artists, bands, you know why you like them. You know, there has to be some reason yeah. behind it. There must be some reason why all these years you've been loving the Beatles since, like you said, since you were four you know, you've got the group recordings, you've got all the solo music, you have this incredible catalog now spanning, it's like <laughs> we're coming up on 60 years here. There has to be a reason why you single them out 
and they stand out among all these other artists. And maybe it also helps to explain why you like other artists. I think it's it's, not, and not just the power pop bands. Right. I think it's easier for me to try to figure out that the Beatles formed the, the, uh, the Beatles kind of laid the groundwork for where I would go as I got older and came of age and learned more uh, and developed my tastes, decided what I did and didn't like. And if you looked at all of the artists that I follow, you probably could make a connection to the fact that they all kind of came from that guitar based rock band format uh, with some diversions. Also, Another thing, and, and now I'm really kind of grasping at, at straws here, I have always tended to be, I've always tended to shy away from what is very trendy, very popular. I almost like don't like having the, the masses force feed something on me. Mm-hmm. And that was really the case when I was very young. And I always joke around with folks saying that in the 70s, when I was in elementary school, there were two groups there were the disco fans, there were the Kiss fans, and then there was Darren with Wings. <laughs> and as popular as Wings were, and the Four Beatles, and the solo stuff, it, there weren't any of my friends or any of my classmates. Nobody was passionate about the Beatles, period. Really? There may have been some fans, there may have been some of the kids in my school that may have liked some of the current hits of Wings, or I mean, some, uh, some of the current songs on the charts from Wings, but there was nobody that was uh, that was really jumping up and down, going crazy, jumping through hoops of fire over the Beatles together or apart. And that may be why the door was wide open for me to go and really embrace them and turn my back on things like Kiss, Disco. And that continued. Late 70s, I remember the wave of, uh, of Billy Joel popularity. Uh, when The Stranger came out, 52nd Street and all mm-hmm. that into the early 80s, I couldn't stand Billy Joel at that time. <laughs> but then for some reason, when I was allowed to discover on my own terms, and I remember it being that live album Songs in the Attic came out, then I was like, huh, because the, the, the mainstream, the, the commercial hubbub was starting to quiet down and come back to earth. And now I didn't have people shoving this new Bill and Joel album down my throat. And I really was connecting with the songs. I did it with Pink Floyd. They're my second favorite band of all time. When the wall came out, I couldn't stand hearing another brick in the wall part two. But as it turned out, once the, you know, excitement over the wall quieted down a couple of years later and the movie came out and I was no longer around a pack of kids who were really into Pink Floyd and the wall then I found myself completely immersed in Pink Floyd my way, on my terms. Did the same thing with Bruce Springsteen. Mid-80s, mm-hmm. I'll play me Springsteen and my skin would fall off. And yet, by the time The Rising came out, I got it because I was able to do it my way. So perhaps the fact that I grabbed hold of the Beatles as tightly as I did could have been because there wasn't, you know, there wasn't, op- you know, there wasn't an overwhelming barrage of Beatle fans and and diehards all around me. I discovered them my way. I listened to them my way. I looked at the pictures. I looked at the album cover photographs, you know, and it clicked. Again, like I said, why the Beatles and why so intense, not the Rolling Stones or the Jackson 5? I don't know. That I never knew, but I just went with it and and they led me down the path that takes me to where I am today, you oh. know, taste wise. And like I said, the majority of the music that I like, not all of it, but the majority of it has that rock slash pop thing happening. The guitar, the three to four minute pop song and uh, and therefore and their art and, <laughs> <laughs> and so on and so forth. I get everything you're saying, but at the same time. You know, Wings was one of the biggest bands of the 70s, period. But there, you know, was, got- there was nobody, for example, like I can go back to my elementary school, okay? And there were many loud, prominent, in-your-face Kiss fans. And the same with Disco. There weren't any Wings fans. 
there may have been some who liked the music, but there was Darren who decorated most of his notebooks and desk blotters, because yes, in Catholic grammar schools, we had to have blotters on our desk. Uh, and I would, when we were allowed to decorate, nine times out of ten, it was either baseball and usually Mets-oriented, football, Jets, or always Wings, and some Beatles. See, this is all your fault, Darren, because she never thought to call me in all that time. <laughs> and by the time we met, we were already, both of us, our roots were in the ground. Yeah. You know, so... Uh, so I'm going back mainly. I was in elementary school from 70 to 79. Back to the Egg came out the week mm -hmm. I graduated eighth grade. You know, so and I remember getting it. I remember playing it. It still reminds me of that summer. The excitement of I'm rid of elementary school. But boy, I've got high school coming in a couple of months. Mm -hmm. still, I still feel that when I hear back to the Egg today. OK, well, we're going to bounce around here. So, uh, there's so many things I'd like to say on this subject, but uh, I want to hear what Alan has to say. In okay. particular, why the Beatles were an influence on you, and in what way? Yeah, pretty much in every way. I mean, I, I'm a little bit older than you guys, uh, so when they came and played on the Ed Sullivan show, I was nine. And at the time was sort of also a classical guy. I was taking piano lessons and violin lessons, stuff like that. And that's really a completely different world, you know. And I wasn't all that concerned about the stuff all of my pals liked, but there was something about the Beatles after, well, even before the Ed Sullivan show. I mean, you know, She Loves You and I Want to Hold Your Hand were saturating the airwaves um, even before... Sullivan and you know you heard them you couldn't not hear them and I kind of liked them and uh, after the Sullivan show when the gum cards came out and the beetle wigs came out and all of the the trinkets and things and um, I actually at that time didn't get very much of that I got gum cards you know everybody got those uh, but otherwise, you know, a lot of my friends had them and we'd go, I'd go like to my friend's basement and we'd put on the beetle wigs and take up a mop or a broom or something and mime to the records and, you know, because he had all the singles and, and uh, you know, there, that was just a lot of fun. But I was still sort of, you know, not necessarily that convinced that this was, you know, what it was for me eventually uh you know liked it a lot but then there was you know time between records and all that and i wasn't necessarily always listening to pop radio um, mm -hmm. but back in those days you know we all had transistor radios that was the thing you couldn't not have it and i probably had it mostly to listen to um yankee games but uh, <laughs> we'll forgive you <laughs> well, you know, because the Mets were just like upstarts, and when they started, they were just pathetic. You know, they were big losers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lot but, easier to go gravitate to the uh, to the to the winning team. <laughs> yes, if you if you prize competence and you know the best, that's what you do. And <laughs> so the Yankees, to me, were the Beethoven of ball games. You know. Anyway. Um, but, you know, the thing is, around then, you know, you're, you're, you're listening to games, the game is only on for a few hours, and then you go dialing through the radio dial, and, uh, and you know, if there was a Beatles song on one of the pop stations in the New York area where I lived, uh, you know, the dial would stay there, and uh, and just really, you know, eventually just got more and more into it, and my closest friends were also... Uh, big Beatle fans, partly, well, my, my closest friend, actually, who <laughs> just lived up the street from me, and he had two older sisters, and so uh, the Beatles were, like, really a part of their household, uh, and my friend, therefore, knew a lot about them, too, and I'd go up there, and we would listen to things, and we... Uh, both started playing the guitar and, uh, you know, started trying to play the stuff that they were doing. And we also began writing songs together. And the songs that we originally did were sort of fractured Beatle tunes. You know, they were like the Beatles songs, but with different lyrics that were sort of topically related to 
something else we were into. And uh, I don't know why we were doing that, but we did that mm. and had a little group in a way. You know, and I was still going back and forth between that and classical music, but it, it sort of occurred to me at some point in there that it didn't have to be one or the other, you know, that there was something really energizing about the sound the Beatles were making and the fact that, you know, within a relatively short time span, it was changing all the time. You just never knew what the next Beatles single was going to be like, you know? Mm hmm I mean, 1964, it was all She Loves You and I Want to Hold Your Hand and the early hits. And then a year later, Nowhere Man was the big hit. And there's a huge difference between She Loves You and Nowhere Man, you know, just in terms of sound, in terms of the kind of writing it is. And, and it just fascinated me that these guys could be so creative and varied. And, uh, you know, then you began sort of reading interviews with them. I mean, I don't think I read that many because I was, you know, it, those weren't the days when you could just find millions of interviews on the internet. You know, it was like things would trickle through. If they came on tour, there might be a little clip on TV of one of their press conferences and, you know, and they would always be funny. And, you know, you sort of got the idea that in addition to all of this incredible music talent, there's this sense of humor going on. And there's this sort of attitude that was coming through that was sort of a, a little anti-authoritarian, eventually right. more than a little anti-authoritarian. And, uh, and that affected me a lot. Uh, I, I, kind of, I kind of liked having people who I looked up to who were not just saying, you know, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. You know, they, it was like, wait a minute, we're the, we're the main show here. And we do what we want to do. That mm -hmm. that whole thing came through, and you know, I'm I'm not sure necessarily that uh, made me a better person. It may have made me a more selfish person, you know. But that was uh, that kind of thing influenced me a lot. Um, and uh, you know, you'd you'd also go out. I mean, this 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 got to be a little dicey because if you wanted to read about them. Um, and we didn't have really access to Beatles Monthly here in the U.S. that easily back then. So what you would get is, you know, Sixteen Magazine. And Sixteen Magazine was, you know, it was sort of like really not for little boys. I mean, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, but you didn't get the impression it was. So you would sort of have to read them, you know, in your house. You wouldn't take them to school but, you know, there were little bits of news in there and there were, you know, and you'd see all these pictures that you'd never seen before as it got to be late 66, early 67. You began to get a sense of what they looked like uh, in their sort of new look, even before you saw the Strawberry Fields promo and and Penny Lane. Uh, and, you know, and then that was another thing, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd come home, listen to the radio, hoping there'd be a new Beatles single and then it would come on, you'd listen really intently, you'd write down the words, you'd do whatever you could, you'd then switch to the other station because maybe they'll play it, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, eventually there, either there'd be something on Sullivan or, you know, Hollywood Palace, whatever it was, that they'd be showing a clip and you would wait intently to see that. You know, I remember when uh, Paperback Writer and Rain were on Ed Sullivan, the next day, I mean, obviously Sullivan was on a Sunday, you know, but by Monday evening, everybody I knew had granny glasses, including me. So, wow. uh, so it was like influential in that kind of way. It was almost like, you know, this is what you lived for, you know, uh, this is what made life bright and happy. And, you know, and, and even now, I mean, I can now say at, uh, you know, almost 65, that one of the great things about being a geezer is that I lived through that era. I didn't have to learn it later, you know. It's sort of like, a, you know, a friend of mine was uh, working in, a, in, in his office and surrounded by all these kids in their 20s, and, and uh, they said, they were saying to him, you know, don't you wish you were our age? Don't you wish you were in your 20s? And he just sort of, like, looked over his glasses and said, I saw the Jimi Hendrix experience live. And I was with him at that show, so I can say the same thing. 
<laughs> and you know, there's this, this is this. There is something to be said for um, you know piling on the years because uh, I. I lived through an incredible time and uh and the beatles were a huge part of that in fact they were like the centerpiece of that for me so. would you say that they influenced the music that you came to love other than the beatles um well and other than classical music i mean because uh, i continue to do that but uh you know in a way the groups that i liked at the time were groups that were a lot like the Beatles. I mean, obviously, with differences, with their own personalities. I mean, I loved the Stones. I loved all the British Invasion things. But, you know, I loved Motown and stuff like that, too. And that was also something that the Beatles were influential in because, you know, they were there sort of covering some of those songs uh, in the on the very early albums and uh you know when sometimes they'd mention it in an interview and you got the idea of you know you wanted to investigate what the beatles thought was cool besides mm -hmm. besides their own stuff and uh and they would mention things and then by by 68 you know, Paul was doing interviews where he's talking about classical composers like Stockhausen and Luciano Berrio and and uh, some other people. And so I began looking into that because that wasn't that far from where I was anyway, you know. Um, but I wasn't listening to that much experimental contemporary classical music. And oddly enough, and I think he'd be happy to hear this, it was Paul, not John. <coughs> who got me listening to that stuff by talking about it and talking about it with some excitement, mm -hmm. you know, and then, you know, as John began doing some of that stuff too, it, it, uh, you know, that sort of, uh, underscored that, you know, so that was like another area to look at, but, but, you know, I, you know, un, un, unlike say, you know, Darren, or possibly even you, like, for me, it wasn't a choice between Michael Jackson or Kiss or Disco. I mean, by the I, by that time that stuff came out, I was like, I don't know. I mean, I never, ever saw anything interesting about the Jacksons. I kind of like Kiss. Um, but to me, Disco is, you know, Disco might as well be, you know, I think I've said my bit about Disco on this show plenty of times, so... Uh-huh. <laughs> um, so to me... We, we even... disagree. We disagree. <laughs> yeah, I but... know. Uh, to me, that wasn't even a contender as music. To me, it was just sort of a beat and not that interesting after you've heard the beat two or three times. So, you know, by then, I mean, my tastes were already sort of firmly established. I was a teenager and, uh, you know, and that was, I don't know, kid stuff or something. But the Beatles never, you know, to me, the Beatles never even got to be a nostalgia issue. It just was always fresh and it was always inventive and it was always uh, a cut above everything else. I mean, much as I love the Stones, given a choice, it was going to be the Beatles. But, you know, Stones did some great stuff, great stuff that the Beatles wouldn't have done. You know, uh, I, I, I couldn't say couldn't have done. But, you know, I, I don't see the Beatles doing stuff on the Beggar's Banquet album, really. You know, they could have, I suppose, but it, it's they, they were moving in a different direction. And you could say that about all the great bands. You could say that about the Kinks. You could say that yeah, about the Who. Absolutely. You know? And I love the Kinks and I love the Who. And I went to, you know, I never got to see the Beatles as a group live. I got to see all those groups, the Stones, the Kinks, the Who. Um, mm hmm but, um, you know, and I really liked them. I collected them, uh, you know, not quite in the, <laughs> at the level that I collect the Beatles. But, you know, I have everything any of these groups did. The Kinks, Stones, Dylan, you know, anything they put out, I got. And uh, just not, you know, necessarily every edition and reissue. So, hmm. but, you know, uh, it was, it, there was a degree to which you know, everything still remained related to the Beatles one way or another. And I remember in the summer of 68, hearing this track on the radio, and it sounded like John Lennon singing, but then sometimes 
other people sounded like John Lennon singing, but it had, you know, kind of distortion that the Beatles never used, and it was a kind of sound the Beatles didn't quite usually do. And I remember thinking as I'm hearing it for the first time, I wonder what the Beatles would make of this. And it turned out to be revolution <laughs> the first time they played it on the radio. So it's, it's just kind of funny that, you know, I, I remember thinking in terms of what they'd make of it, and it turned out to be them. Mm, very interesting. You know, um, as far as myself, I, I could fill up several hours talking about how the Beatles influenced me. I mean, they're the biggest influence on my life in so many ways. They're an influence as far as how they are as people. They're fascinating, each of the four of them, in their own way. They've all taught me life's lessons in, in their own different ways. But since we don't have enough time for you know a two-hour show here, to focus mainly on the music, I would say that I have very eclectic music tastes, and uh, it's partly due to the Beatles, not entirely due to the Beatles, because in addition to hearing Beatles music as a kid, I heard all different styles of music from folk music like Peter, Paul, and Mary to uh, classic uh, show music from Rodgers and Hammerstein to West Side Story to all the top 40 music of the 60s on my, as you said, Alan, transistor radio. Mm -hmm. And top 40 radio was so diverse back then as it was in the 70s. And I always love bringing this up because there's a lot of young people who might be listening to the show who don't know what radio was like in those days. If you listen to the hits of that time, you could have everything from the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, to Louis Armstrong doing Hello, Dolly, to uh, Roger Miller doing King of the Road, uh, to all kinds of music like that, different genres of music all being mixed together. And I took it in like a sponge. And But the Beatles were front and center at all that, because from the very beginning, their music was very diverse. And then if you get into anything like Revolver or Sgt. Pepper or the White Album, you couldn't find a band that tackled more musical styles than the Beatles. Mm -hmm. And it made me appreciate all these different genres. And I've said this before, you know, that the fact that on the White Album, you're going from Helter Skelter to Honey Pie in the same breath to Revolution Number no. 9, <laughs> you know, it... The spectrum was so wide with the Beatles, and, you know, I was never one of those people that said, I only like the rock, you know, I don't like the ballads, or, you know, it was kind of difficult for me as a little kid to adjust to the Indian music. That took a while for me to appreciate. Uh, the weird stuff as a little kid, like I am the walrus, took a while for me to, to appreciate. But when you're hit with all this music at a very early age, it has a profound effect on you. But the Beatles were right there, at, at, you know, front and center of it all for me. And I, I give them so much credit for making me appreciate so many styles of music. And to this day, I like everything from what you might consider bubblegum to heavy metal and everything in between. The 70s had a very big impact on me because Top 40 Radio was the same way. I could love everything from ABBA to Led Zeppelin to the Partridge Family to... The you know R and B stuff of the seventies, and Stevie Wonder, and all the solo Beatles stuff, and all the progressive rock of that time, and the singer songwriters. I think being exposed to all this music, with the Beatles right there at the at the the heart of it all, helped me to appreciate all this stuff. And um, also because of the Beatles, I would say that I tend to appreciate bands that have more than one lead vocalist or more than one main songwriter. Uh, those bands, I wouldn't say are necessarily better, but to me, they're more interesting with more of a, collaborate, uh, more of a collaboration. Uh, bands like Wings, which I put in the same category, or The Traveling Wilburys, or Fleetwood Mac, The Eagles, Badfinger would, would fall in that category, Genesis, bands like those. I find those bands more interesting. I also like bands that only have one lead singer and one songwriter as well. I also appreciate artists who evolve and try different things instead of being mainly formulaic. So, you know, if someone like Paul likes to dabble in the new sounds of the time, I applaud him for that. I don't see him as jumping on the bandwagon. I see him as trying to experiment and trying to grow as an artist 
and not just put out the same thing over and over again. So I think because the Beatles were that way in the 60s, I mean, that was some template to follow there. And nobody has ever been able to match it the way the Beatles have. But I tend to appreciate the artists who keep on trying different things. Doesn't mean I like everything that they do. I mentioned Todd Rundgren. I'm a big fan of Todd. Todd musically is all over the place. I have tremendous respect for him. There's a lot of stuff he's done that I haven't cared for, but I respect the fact that he tries different things. And I think a lot of that comes from growing up with the Beatles. You know, I appreciate artists who are more versatile, like a Paul McCartney or a Todd Rundgren, giving examples like that. So in that way, musically, the Beatles had a massive effect on me. Well, hearing your answer, hearing your answer basically... You know, and trying to compare it to where, uh, to to my uh, to my response and how the Beatles affected me, I never really gravitated towards things necessarily or paid very close attention to a band with multiple frontmen or m- numerous vocalists like or songwriters like you just mentioned, Ken. That aspect of what an artist slash band w- was all about didn't necessarily matter to me. Um, so that's why I could say that, yeah, the Beatles had uh, more than one singer, more than one songwriter. That's not necessarily why I ended up being coming eventually a Pink Floyd fan or why uh, when I was a kid growing up, I liked the Steve Miller band a lot, who had one central figure, uh, obviously. <laughs> Guess who? Um, <laughs> it was more, I think stylistic to this the Beatles style uh their tendency at their core of being that you know band guitar bass drums type band that was you know something that stuck with me but don't you think the Beatles were more interesting because of the fact that they had four different lead vocalists three main songwriters well two with a third that was growing uh as a songwriter and don't you think it made the band more interesting you know what, though? It could be because I came to the party late. Because they pretty much had broken up already, they broke that ground. By the time I was beginning to, you know, find what I liked and find found find my way through music, a lot of that had already happened, and there were so many bands that had multiple front men or multiple lead singers or main songwriters that, to me, it took time for me to realize how unique the Beatles were, but I didn't get the groundbreaking aspect of what the Beatles did. Didn't necessarily have, I hope I'm making sense here. Didn't necessarily have that impact on me because I missed the ground. The ground was broken already. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It only, you don't, you don't have to have lived through it to really appreciate that aspect of it, but because other bands had already done it by the time you were realizing the Beatles had done it, Maybe you couldn't appreciate it as much. I didn't appreciate it as much. It took me getting older and learning more and more and more as time passed. And I began to put things in order. You know, this came first and this happened. This is why people were reacting to the song the way they were reacting to it. It didn't mean as much to me when I was 12 as it does when I turned 45. Mm Mm-hmm really was able oh okay now i see they were doing this and you know it was more of a general stylistic sound that the beatles had generally speaking uh that steered me in the direction of what taste you know what my tastes ended up being Mm -hmm. don't know if any of that made sense yeah it does Mm -hmm. uh i don't i don't know alan do, do you feel in some way like i just expressed that the Beatles and bands like those are more interesting, or maybe you don't agree with me. Well, you know, it, each each band has its own chemistry, and you know, it needs and uh, has evolved in a particular way depending on the the talents and abilities sort of in the group. So I, I'm not sure that I would necessarily. Uh, make it a hierarchical thing but it it was definitely one of the interesting things about the Beatles and especially at the time it was unusual so yeah I I, 
but I understand what Darren's saying too. So. See, I, yeah, I missed out on, I missed out on the ground being broken. It was broke. Everything was done. Other bands were influenced, copied, were you know, or, or developed the, the way they were going to develop from having heard the Beatles. You know, I was still sorting through growing up slowly through the seventies. Things like, oh, the Hey Jude album. That was a collection of singles. I didn't know that because to my young ears, Rain, Hey Jude, I should have known better, were all cut from the same cloth. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Which now I know they, of course, I found out uh, that, no, that wasn't the case. I should have known better was the quote unquote early years. Hey Jude was later. Rain was in the middle. It all kind of blended as one cohesive sound to me. Right. You know, when I was. And yet, if they had played a concert that late, they could easily have had all those songs in a set and played them the way they played on the records, and it would have fit together, too. So that's probably what you're what you were imagining, you know, that this is a this is a group that has that kind of versatility. And now it's I should have known better. And over here, it's Hey Jude and Rain. So it's interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. I then had to take all of those pieces and put them, find my way, do it myself, and put them in the proper order, you know, uh, after the fact. Mm -hmm. Oh, and they have more than one singer or more than one songwriter, like blah, 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 even though the Beatles came first. That part of it, the Beatles having come first, didn't resonate with me when I was younger. Probably uh-huh. created problems for other bands in a way, you know. I mean, if, if it, in the previous model, you had a front guy uh, who was, you know, the singer. He may or may not have played an instrument, but it was the sort of focus of attention. And you had perhaps, you know, someone who wrote or they might not have even written their own stuff at all. Um, but, you know, seeing the Beatles as a model, you, you could have have bands where everybody wants to be the front guy and everybody wants to have, you know, the, his own songs done. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I could see how in a way they uh, upset the apple cart, so to speak. You know, in this in this case of front men and singers and singers, you know, I was uh, from probably about eight or nine years of age, a big fan of Chicago, mm-hmm. three yeah. singer. Um, you know, I didn't get the song, the, the number of songwriters down as much when I was younger, but three different distinct vocalists, you know, already established facet of rock music mm-hmm. in the mid 70s, multiple front men. You know, uh, the Beatles were just another band that had multiple front men. Mm-hmm. Oh, and then later on, I realized Let's go back in 63 as they began to emerge out of England. That was unique. That was mm-hmm. actually fairly uncommon. Yeah. Well, I, even as a little kid, I noticed the different lead vocalists in the Beatles. So to me, it's always made them more fascinating. Yeah. I, that knew, way. I knew there were different singers. I knew Paul. I knew when John sang. I knew George. It's just the uniqueness of it was lost on me at first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I get that. But to me, also, the contrast between, you know, John as a songwriter and Paul as a songwriter and George as a songwriter made them, like I said, more fascinating to me. You know, and the old model persisted at the same time, you know, I mean, with the Stones. um, Okay, Keith sang a couple of songs here and there, but, you know, Mick was really the front man. With the Kinks, Dave sang a couple of songs here and there, but it was mainly Ray's show. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, Zeppelin... Uh, you got Robert Plant as the front man, although, you know, you, you, you got the firm sense that Page was uh, really, in, in a lot of ways, the driving force behind it, even even more than Plant. Uh, but it, at any rate, those two were at least equal. Um, even the Who, you know, because you had Doltry mm-hmm. singing, but occasionally Pete would take a lead. Yep. And then it was Pete who was the guy doing the writing. And let's not forget John Entwistle occasionally taking a lead too. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's uh, some of the reasons, some of the ways, I should say, how the Beatles influenced me. And like I said, I can go on and on on this, especially how they all influenced me individually. But we'll have to save that, I think, for another show. 
because <laughs> we're already what <laughs> uh, an hour and a half here. And I'm happy to say that in the time that we've done the show, uh, I'm walking again. And uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right. So why don't we just uh, give the folks uh, our contact information, beginning with you, Alan. Okay. Um, easiest way to get to me is on Facebook, um, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And you can reach all of us here on th- by email on things we said today radio show at gmail.com that's things we said today radio show is one word at gmail.com we have a twitter account at things we said fab and we have a group facebook page things we said today beatles radio fans okay darren how about you if you want to email me you could email me at wfuv and the address is my name spelled out, Darren, Darren DeVivo, at WFUV.org. And if you go to Facebook, I have two pages, but the main, the page that I would prefer you go to is the one called Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio. And uh, we'll be in touch that way. Okay. And for those that don't know, WFUV has such fine programming. And one of the things that I love about the station is when they do thematic sets, which I do all the time for a Beatles show. I I will let everyone know that uh, when Darren returns, he plans on doing a knees set. So if any of you would like to volunteer with songs that he could use to welcome him back. (laughs) I think I did that six years ago when I hurt my other knee. Okay. I did I did a set on falling and knees and and uh, all kinds of you know clutch songs and stuff like that. Mm. Now falling is easy. I've just seen a face. Uh, <laughs> I can't stand up for falling down. <laughs> and you've got honey pie uh, makes me weak in the knees. There you go. <laughs> all right, so enough. We, can, we can provide that for you. <laughs> just Alan and myself. <laughs> All right. As far as myself, if you'd like to reach me, Ken Michaels, you could do so at my email address, which is every little thing at att.net. And uh, please be sure to check out my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. Loads of interviews with people in the Beatle world, always new ones being posted. Uh, lots of uh, incredible prizes you can win on my trivia and games page, like books, CDs, and DVDs. Be sure to check it all out at KenMichaelsRadio.com. All right, this has been a fun show. I hope you all enjoyed it. If you want to uh, write to us with how the Beatles influenced you, I love reading anything from the fans, as do all of us. So uh, feel free to write to us here at, uh, at Things We Said Today. So, for Darren DeVivo and Alan Cozen, this is Ken Michaels thanking all of you for listening, and we will see you next time. Take care.